Hi everyone, I want to try to zip through a bit of foundational information for you uh, for the class. And these are sort of the objectives, really just to get you to examine some of the foundational content and start to relate some of the concepts that we're going to talk about this semester. I want to get grounded together on what occupational therapy is from my perspective or maybe your readings perspective or a collective of those things. The art and science is often commonly seen as part of our definitions of helping people do activities that are meaningful to their health and well-being through the use of occupation is usually how you see the definition. I think we use a number of uh, interventions to help people to do the activities that are meaningful to their health and well-being. So engaging in occupation, in what we consider purposeful activity, changing the physical space, the social context to give extra support compensatory strategies, using preparatory activity like strengthening or stretching, um, using education, using advocacy, and certainly a therapeutic use of oneself. This semester we're going to focus mostly on the educating and advocating. Just keep that in mind. Another definition is the therapeutic use of occupations, including everyday activities with individuals, groups, populations, or organizations to support their participation, their performance, and their functioning roles. I mention this one because we're going to be focusing less on the individuals this semester and more on groups or communities, populations, and organizations. I think it's important just to ground ourselves in the World Health Organization's definition of health because that's ultimately where our, 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 one of our contextual lenses, like when we put on our OT glasses, one of the elements of the lens we view the world through is this broad definition of, of health. What I think is most interesting, though, here is that this has not been amended since 1948. So for your time as an occupational therapist and mine, this has been the definition of health, but it was not the definition of health necessarily when our profession was first developed. I also want to bring your attention back to the Ottawa Charter of Health Promotion. I know that you looked at this in, in your pub health course and your popula I guess what was that population health course, something like that, or health promotion course you took. We're going to be focusing on interventions that I think will fit within these health promotion actions. I think you've probably learned these types of interventions in the past, but we're going to hone some of these, I think, at, in this fourth year of your education. I think it's important to go back and look at some history of the profession as we get started in a course on occupational science, and we'll talk more about that on Tuesday as to why I think that's important. And hopefully you've read somewhere that the root of the word occupational therapy, when the founders got together and named the profession, they were thinking of this Latin root, occupatio, which they thought of it as meaning a taking of possession or occupying or seizing opportunities. So that was really where this came from. And, you know, I could mm, question it a bit, but that's, I just think it's important for us to know where they were coming from. And also to look back at the original constitution for the National Society for the Promotion of OT. And I did go in search of some foundational materials for OT in Australia, yet it seemed that the history in Australia related back to the history in the United States. So I don't mean to be uh, ethnocentric about this. Uh, and please bring to my attention more information that I haven't yet run across. But anyway, I think it's important. The National Society for the Promotion of OT eventually became the American Occupational Therapy Association. But I think it's good to look at what their constitution was. And this was the founders that we read about in all these books that we, we read with Eleanor Clark Slagle and, and so on. The advancement of occupation as a therapeutic measure, the study of the effect of occupation on human being, and the scientific dispensation of this knowledge. This was in March of 1917. We are now at March of 2014. We are just shy of 100 years as a profession. I want to know when we talk next week, how do you think we're doing on meeting these aims that were developed <laughs> almost 100 years ago? I think it's important also to revisit the construct of occupation. These are five definitions here, and you've got at least five that are reflected in one of the first chapters that I'm requiring you to read this semester. 
So the point of this is not just to muddy the waters, but to just really help us see the breadth and the depth of this construct for us. You know, naturally it's got something about doing. It's something that it's engaging in familiar and ordinary things, things of meaning, things that relate to certain functions that we have in our life. I happen to love how Christensen describes that it's a mechanism that enables people to develop and express their identities. I think that is really what we do as occupational therapists, is we really help people to establish or restore their identities again, because we, we are really humanly def defined by the occupations we engage in. And Ann Wilcock is one of my heroes of occupational science, and uh, I love that she has really a biological premise to the idea that occupation is a human and an innate need, and that it's a natural mechanism for health for the organism that we are as human beings. Uh, you can read in the one of the first chapters that I've asked you to read this, this week about occupation and the occupationalness of life or being a connoisseur of occupation and, and looking inward. The example given is about gardening. I'd like you to ponder, you know, maybe an occupation that you engage in in a similar way that Virginia Dickey talks about how she looked at gardening and she looked inward at herself. I just thought of, you know, maybe caring for a pet is something that has gone from being, you know, a, a pleasure to a chore to a pleasure in, in your life from maybe I know my niece and nephew, they love their puppy dog, but sometimes when they're asked to, to do things to take care of her, they groan because it feels like a chore <laughs> as opposed to pleasure. Also, I want you to be looking outside from this moment on. As soon as you finish this video, I want you to really put on your OTIs and, and really look at the occupationalness of life, which we do through observing, you know, through listening, through asking, and through studying occupation. I love this statement that Virginia Dickey makes in her reading, that occupation is a transaction within the environmental context. Any of you who've had a conversation with me just about occupational therapy in general know that I have a real passion for the idea that, that the interaction between who we are as people, what we do as, with our, as our occupations, and the human and non-human environment around us, to me, really are so interconnected that it, it, it drives our health or our illness. Uh, I liken it to the, the concept of ecology and to an ecosystem. I think we're going to be looking at occupational science in the community. And I think each of us as individuals live within our own little petri dish or live within our own little ecosystem. But within a community or a population, it's even more important to pay attention to that. And so I just, I'm a visual person, so I, and I love frogs. I think they are great examples of transformation, but I think they also offer us a way of reminding ourselves about that science we learned long ago, the ecosystem. And here's this cute little frog who's probably had his fill of flies for the day and chilling out on his lily pad in a very healthy ecosystem. And so his occupations are quite healthy. However, this is a little guy that probably lives in an ecosystem that's got too much nitrogen or pollutants and things like that, and naturally is going to find um, a very different path of life. So I just want you to be keeping the idea of ecology or human ecology in your mind through this course. Because that also uh, brings to our attention another construct that's real popular now. But interestingly, in 1977 is when the idea of occupational justice and injustice in, in many ways really was coined. By uh, I think it was a medical doctor at the time who was writing about occupational therapy in 1977, a great article actually. People are healthy or diseased in terms of activities open to or denied them. Another powerful idea to keep in mind this semester. Uh, so to me, if we don't have access to occupation, we are occupationally ill. And occupational justice has been the modern day term for the, the rights and the responsibilities and the liberties that an, an enable an individual to engage in health through occupation. Occupational injustice is naturally the denial of this opportunity. You're going to read about this in the, the leisure course with Kirsty. You're going to use a different reference than we use in this course, but together I think it all really will make sense. 
we're going to focus more on these first three and less on imbalance. And in her course, you're going to focus more on occupational imbalance. But we'll talk about that more on Tuesday and the following Tuesday. This is actually information from a reading that you're assigned for the following week, but something I am sure that you've read about or have heard about, about how our client is not just the individual. So in this semester, I want you to be thinking if you were hired as a consultant, or if you were going to launch your own NGO or your own business, I want you to think entrepreneurial or social entrepreneurship. Okay, put that kind of hat on in the fourth year of your OT program. And so we're going to be focusing on an intervention that's going to target either an organization like a school or a, a company or a community like a community that maybe is in this particular rural or remote geographic location or a community of like individuals, um, a community of, of um, children or, or such, or a population perhaps of older adults with low vision or something like that, okay? I want you to start really paying attention to occupation in your community and seeing what works, what doesn't work. What are the factors of the environment, the physical environment and the non-human environment that make or break a person's ability to engage in occupation in their community? What makes for a healthy community? How do sporting teams contribute to a community? I think we're about to start. This is American gridiron or American football, but I think the, the rugby season starts this week. So how does that contribute to a community's expression of itself? What about, we've got school just starting, so what about the engagement of school for school-age kids? How is that occupation in the community? Or what happens when we enjoy a farmer's market or we look around at when our neighbors are growing vegetables or we participate in a co-op? Um, or when we pay a visit and maybe uh, observe um, you know, our Nana or something who might be living in a, a senior community and this kind of community. I've worked with clients where if you were no longer able to play this game, you might as well be dead, basically. You, you don't exist in the community if you can't participate in the occupations of the community. Which leads me to also want to talk about the idea that are all occupations health promoting? Um, no, <laughs> I don't think they are. And in your reading, you can read about some ways of looking at the question of are all occupations health promoting or not? But here are, are many people engaged in occupation or not. And the question is, are these occupations really, are they destructive to a person's humanness or are they contributing to a person's humanness? I also want you to be thinking of the following question. What disciplines that you've studied, you know, you've taken a, an array of, of, of courses in these three years so far, and maybe even outside of, of these years. So there's many disciplines that might offer some evidence to the, to the answer of what's the relationship between human engagement in activities and health. What disciplines offer evidence to answer how do human beings learn to be competent participating masters of their environment. How does one influence the state of their own health through the use of hands, mind, and will? So perhaps that quote uh, reminds you of something that you've read in OT. And does is this true? What disciplines, what information supports this point? And if so, how does this happen? How do we know that if we are engaging our hands and our mind and our will, that we are influencing our own health. Where is the science? What discipline helps us answer these questions? So that's where I'm going to leave you. Uh, ponder that question. Think about the foundations of this course. Think about the concepts of occupation, occupational therapy, health, and community. Begin to notice the occupational illness of life around you and notice the evidence of occupational illness in your community. You're going to be diagnosing some condition of occupational illness in the community, and that's what you're going to structure all of your assessments on this semester. So start to pay attention to that, okay? And, um, you know, get through some of the readings as best you can, and we'll go from there. Have a great weekend.